Hi, I'm uh, Stephen Wen from the Department of Kinesiology and Physical Education at Wilfrid Laurier University. I started work here at Laurier in 1993, uh, so I've moved past the 20 year mark and my area of specialization within uh, kinesiology and physical education is sport history, specifically the history of the Olympic Games and uh, really I, I like to analyze uh, television rights negotiations and corporate sponsorship as it has evolved with respect to the Olympic movement. As a co-author, I've worked on uh, two major book projects while I've been here at Laurier. One is entitled Selling the Five Rings, the International Olympic Committee and the Rise of Olympic Commercialism. Uh, and that really charts the, the growth of the IOC as an organization that wanted very little to do with money to one that's pretty adept at raising it today. Um, the second book, a more recent book from December 2011, is entitled Tarnished Rings, the International Olympic Committee and the Salt Lake City Bid Scandal. And that book really tracks the IOC's effort to recover from the scandal uh, that broke out when uh, the media got wind that uh, a number of IOC members had accepted money and gifts and benefits allegedly in exchange for their support for Salt Lake City for the 2002 Olympic Winter Games. More recently what I've been looking at actually is uh, in conjunction with some colleagues the 30th anniversary of the Los Angeles Games and I think that Games actually is exceedingly informative today, especially when we take note that the Sochi Olympics have uh, rung up a, a bill of some $51 billion. Um, you know, when you look back to Los Angeles, Peter Uberoth, the head of the LA Organizing Committee, was able to uh, turn a $232.5 million profit. Now, that may not be in the cards for organizing committees today, but I sure think you've got a much better chance of coming out of this in a more financially secure uh, position if you put a much greater emphasis on pre-existing facilities and, and both organizers and the IOC uh, must do that in the future to keep the cost for organizers down. I think the IOC actually has to give some consideration to, to meaningful ways in which it could keep the cost down for organizers. And I can think of two right off the top of my head. One is when uh, a city is awarded the games, they actually receive the right to host the, time, the games twice in succession. Uh, the first time, obviously, the debt likely is accrued, but the second time they could pay it off. The other way the IOC could go about this is to award the games to two different cities on two different continents. Uh, therefore, you could split up the opening and closing ceremonies, you could split up athletics and track and field if we're talking about the summer games, and then you could assign sports to the two respective cities based on sporting preference, cultural preference in that country so that you've got fewer white elephant facilities left at the end of the whole exercise. Um, will the IOC give consideration to ideas like this? Not likely, it's a very tradition bound organization. I know in the past they faced pressure to actually have a permanent site for the Olympic Games for both winter and summer. Well, you can scratch that off your list. The IOC is never going to move in that direction. Well, as my students will tell you, I'm a hockey fan. Um, I'm more than that. I'm a Toronto Maple Leaf fan. Uh, so I'll be watching hockey, both men's and women's, and I'll be really interested in, in how those competitions unfold. With respect to the men's competition, I'll have sort of a, a more quiet, subtle support for the American team because, of course, Phil Kessel and James Van Riemsdyk are playing uh, for the American team. But I'll be waving the Canadian flag along with everybody else, and I look forward to uh, really exciting hockey.